Um, this is a hundred and something year old garment factory. So wow, like so way, cool. way back in the day and my unit, can you see these wow. steel doors back here? Yeah. yeah. Wow. My unit is the only unit in the, I, it, like this actually has a number over it. So I don't know if it was like the safe room, like the vault <laughs> or whatever it was. Nice. But yeah, it's really cool. So it has all the character. They did a pretty good job in converting these to lofts. Oh, it looks epic. Like wow. I've always ago. wanted, yeah. I've always wanted to run a practice. Like I'm a chiropractor and I always wanted to run a practice in like a, in a space that's like an old, warehousey kind of vibe it just totally so i love cool. it yeah. i fell in love with these totally. kind of spaces when we lived in new york city and of course i couldn't afford anything like <laughs> i couldn't even afford one of those doors in new york city so <laughs> when we got to chicago it was like yes we can find this space <laughs> and i've just Cool stuff. Well, good afternoon there, Shelly Paxton from Chicago in your smart industrial office there. Thank you so much for joining us today on the Ridiculously Human podcast. Thanks for having me. It's good mm -hmm. to see you guys in person. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Virtual in person anyway. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> looking at your faces and hearing your voices. <laughs> exactly, exactly. We were just discussing uh, how good this actually is, this medium with all the coronavirus going on. So um, we are happy to be part of that trend. Um, We're engaging in safe practices. Yes, yes exactly. <laughs> Always a good thing. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So, Shelly, uh, we actually have, um, firstly, I'd like to thank Mandy Leto, actually, for putting us in touch with you. Like, we had her on the podcast uh, quite a few months ago and, like, had the, the absolute best conversation with her. And then she was like, well, you've got to get in touch with this lady, Shelly. She's the best. So, um, you know, we're really, really thankful for the introduction and, and now that we've kind of made this sort of happen, basically. I'm super grateful too. She's been a friend for about 20 years now. She's a, a dear friend and we're on this coaching journey together and she's such a beautiful soul. So I'm glad, I'm glad you guys connected with her first so I could be here now. Oh, that's so cool. Beautiful. So, so how did you guys meet 20 years ago? <laughs> the short version of the story is that one of Mandy's brothers is one of my best friends. Ah. So, and I met him in Istanbul. He still lives in Istanbul. So we'll, mm. I'm sure we'll get there at some point in our journey. We'll talk about um, my time there, but I was there for four and a half years and he was um, dating at the time, uh, one of my very dear friends. Ah. He eventually got married and had a kid and I got to know the entire family. And every time I'm in London, I would spend time with Mandy. And then Ultimately, when I left Harley, our worlds kind of came back together as I started to go down this coaching path. And you know Mandy, I mean, she's such a big hearted, generous spirit. Oh, she yeah. immediately was like, how can I support you? And it brought us back together. Now I would say she's one of my best friends. So wow, it's really amazing. incredible. Yeah. Two amazing human beings. Wow. Mm. Yeah, that's for sure. And I she's also very blessed. Yeah, yeah. And she's also written one of the like the featured reviews on your book, which is really cool. I read that. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's a nice little addition there. Um, and then I also just wanted to say thanks to your PR ladies, uh, Noel and Christina. They've been like really really awesome you know and just like absolute delights to deal with so you know thank you to them for helping you know set this conversation up um, yeah i yeah. love them <laughs> yeah i can imagine you do they're really cool um and helpful yeah so let's kind of get into it right it's like um you start your book okay with this awesome kind of little couple of lines to my parents thank you for raising me to be independent courageous and curious I know I've made you regret it on more than one occasion. So I was thinking like maybe a nice way to sort of ease into things is with you and your mom chasing each other around the kitchen with knives mm -hmm. in your hands. <laughs> maybe you can tell us a little bit more around that story. Oh man. Wow. Talk about diving right in. Yeah. So if you ever, <laughs> if you ever wanted to know where the rebel in a corporate rebels guide to finding your best life came from, you need look no further than my childhood. So I think I, I came out of the womb rebelling against everything, against my parents, against tradition, against religion. I mean, you name it, you know, against any sort of rules and authority figure. And so um, I, I, my parents were quite strict. They were very Catholic, quite strict. And I, I was growing up in this household thinking, how, how did I get here? Like, I don't even feel like I belong here. Who are these people? How am I product? <laughs> if I didn't look so much like my mom and dad. 
And so I created a lot of tension in the household, a lot when I was young. I went from, I think I say in the book, like I went from being a competitive swimmer. I was really big in swimming. I was a breaststroker. I was competing at the national level. And then I really quickly pivoted into competitive drinking and like sex, drugs, and rock and roll (laughs) became my thing. And, you know, for better and for worse, right? It was me sort of expressing and, and really just trying to figure out who I am at, at a very early age. And, and so, again, that, you know, that really challenged my parents. They were young parents. I was the eldest. I have one sister who's three and a half years younger um, who bore the brunt of a lot of this. And so, you know, my parents are figuring out how to navigate this very strong-willed, rebellious child, and it did kind of come to blows. And by blows, I do mean knives and <laughs> chasing well. each other around the kitchen. And um, because I just think we both, you know, we, we didn't really have the tools or the skill set. Like, I think about everything that I have in my, you know, the arrows I have in my quiver today as a coach and knowing how to work through stuff and be vulnerable. And my parents didn't have any of those mm-hmm. arrows. I certainly didn't have any of those arrows. And we were just sort of like, you know, well, you show up, we have our shit together. That's the Paxton's. And when stuff got messy, it was uncomfortable for everyone. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> wow. It, and then, sorry, sorry it, it, it sounds like, um, well, you mentioned in the book that you were kind of, or you felt like the sort of black sheep of the family a little bit. Um, but just going back to the kind of rebellious side of things, do you think being rebellious kind of has helped you in your life? Absolutely. Absolutely. And I would say, I mean, there's so many different ways I could take this answer. I think one thing I'll say is, more recently, as I've gone on this sabbatical journey, one of the things that I've realized is I've made this massive shift from, you know, my younger years where I was rebelling against everything to realizing that there's incredible power in rebelling for something. Hmm. So I think that's an interesting thing just to kind of plant for our conversation today. So now I'm realizing like, oh, that rebellion has, it served me in different ways because I've had a lot of life experiences. I've made a lot of mistakes. I've been, you know, I've done probably every drug on the, under the sun except for like crystal meth and I've probably drank everything. And I've, you know, like I, I experimented a lot. And I think in a way that's good because it got me into this mindset of being courageous, ex- being experimental, being okay with being different or unique in some capacity because I always really thought I was I felt so different growing up in a very kind of homogenous you know I grew up in the western suburbs of Minneapolis Minnesota so here in the Midwest and in the north everybody pretty much looked the same and I was like I don't think these are my people but who are my people so I think it served me well because it almost in a way sent me on this journey that here I am decades later, I'm still on that journey and I'm finding my people and I'm expressing myself so much more authentically and I'm channeling rebellion in such a beautiful and empowering way. Now I rebel for who I am and what I want and the impact that I want to have in the world and it feels constructive versus destructive, Mm -hmm. right? Yeah, I like that a lot. It's really powerful. And I think you could probably extrapolate that to so many things that can, you know, without having some kind of context for things, they can go off the rails, but sort of other traits maybe in your life. But as you get older, you can start to harness these things for good. I think, um, uh, yeah, it's just one of those beauty, sort of beautiful things of getting older that we can start to use like maybe negative traits at one stage into positive focused sort of laser like yeah. drives for our lives. And, and what is your, what was your relationship with your sister like at that time? Because she was sounded, sounds like she was a bit of the one in the middle there. Yeah, she was, well, I, I would say in no uncertain terms, we hated each other. <laughs> we were really young. We're, we're super close now, but that has, you know, just like my relationship with my parents, it took decades to get to a level of emotional maturity and, you know, realization. Um, so we're all very close as a family, especially after my dad's stroke. And we'll, we'll get there because that's, I think, a pivotal point in my journey as well. Um, but yeah, she was, you know, she was sort of the cute young cheerleader who would tell on me when I was like hiding beer (laughs) under my bedside table, you know, doing ridiculous teenage things. Let's be honest. I mean, 
you know, as you as you've read one of the stories in the book, one of the chapters is that time I drove my car into a lake. So there is no like I was doing really silly stuff. If I were my parents, I'd be I'd be like wanting to ship me off to boarding school as well. So my sister was my sister was super excited that I got shipped out of the house and that she got and she used that as leverage to get a family dog. So I was like, so for, totally, right? She's genius. She's genius. And she's super funny. And so to this day, I'm like, you know, I'm not sure I'll ever forgive you, right? Because she basically did the like, oh, like she wasn't sad that I was gone, but she yeah. really, really wanted a dog. And she Classic. played it. She played it beautifully. Yeah. Oh, man. She's also got some skills there that she's uh, using for good in the world. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But and I'll say, like, I bailed her out. Like, as she, as she got into, you know, her, you know, middle school and high school, and she started to experiment with these things, like, I bailed her out on a number of occasions. And then once I went <laughs> off to college, we started to kind of see each other as, like, real humans and not feel feel any sort of sibling rivalry and then we started to get closer and closer over over time but and I had her she and my mom were the first two people to read the initial draft of the manuscript because oh, cool. I didn't want them to be surprised by anything here not that they mm. had any say over what I put in the book but I wanted them to be able to ask me questions and have the dialogue before you know it went out into the world and that helped me I think that was a crucial step for me to make peace with putting my bare naked soul, you know, mm. out into the world for consumption as well. Oh, it's so cathartic, isn't it? To oh. write it all out and, uh, and then also have people, you might, it must've been really nerve wracking just to say, here it is, have a read. Like, this is, this is it, how I feel and how I felt towards you really, you know? And, um, yeah. Wow, it's, yeah. It's really and to be really way. honest, there were, there were things in that book that my mom didn't know. I never shared with my family that I got an abortion. And whatever mm. people's views are on that, it's an edgy thing to put out into the yeah. world. And it's certainly an edgy thing. Like, you know, I can feel my palms sweating, right? Even as I say it again, mm. to have your mother read. And, and beyond that, now that it's out in the world, one of the first people who got a hard copy of my book was my 95-year-old grandmother. Mm. I'm lucky wow. enough to still have one surviving grandparent. You, my, my grandfather from my dad's side is in the book. My grandmother on my mom's side, I thought, well, I'm so different, like, because I've always kind of felt like the black sheep and they're the more religious side of the family. And, um, you know, I didn't think she'd appreciate all the F-bombs in the book and the mm. fact that I'm a recovering Catholic and, you know, all of these <laughs> things. I thought, oh, this is not going to go well. And I certainly yeah. don't want to be responsible for my grandmother's death from having read my book. Right? <laughs> like, little heart that attack. That is not yeah. cool, totally. Yeah. I was like, somebody have the paddles with the, like, little resuscitation <laughs> kit ready. Ready and, for <laughs> and she sent me, in fact, it's sitting on the other side of my computer. Um, she read it and she sent me the most beautiful letter. It's a handwritten wow. letter that I'm going to frame. And it was, it was just such a lesson in unconditional love. I posted about it on social media and I shared the letter openly because it, I, I think I cried for, well, 30 minutes at least when I initially read it. I was just in a heap on the floor and then every time I looked at it, probably for a good three days, and I was like, this was such a lesson from the universe because I thought she would judge me. Mm -hmm. And her first words were, no words you ever use could change how much I love you. And I wow. was like, Whoa. so that's a long-winded way of saying this book has taught me so many lessons. Mm -hmm. And I don't think, I, don't, I think I'm only at the beginning of how many lessons it's going to continue to teach me and how much healing and beauty it's brought me. Wow. Isn't it fun? The, this ride we're all on. Hey, wow. Mm. And um, so Shelly, just sort of coming back to your story a little bit. Um, the, like many people, you actually sold your soul to the corporate world. And uh, after working a few years in the biggest and best advertising, advertising agencies, uh, you took your first sabbatical at uh, 26 years old. So why was, taking a, a, a sabbatical so important to you and, and what were some of your biggest uh, insights and, and lessons that you took away from it? Yeah, well, so let's get one thing really clear. I didn't realize until at the age of 49, I'm writing this book 
And I go back and I'm looking at my journals and I'm thinking about how the story arc of this book. And I'm like, yeah, what was I going through at 26 that made me want to kind of just step away and take this break? So the word sabbatical, even the word sabbatical wasn't so much in my vocabulary. I just felt this sense. So, so, so one thing, like in retrospect, I look back at that and I'm like, hello, my soul was trying to speak to me at 26 years old. Hmm. I was, I was only, you know, five years into my corporate career, into this kind of sexy global world of advertising. Hmm. And yet something was trying to speak to me. Right. And now I know it was my soul. So I looked back and I was like, oh my God. That was actually my first sabbatical. I just didn't know it back then. And then through, I don't know, some miracle, I found the journals from that, from that period of time. Hmm. So I sat with those journals as I was writing the book and I was really looking in, in real time at like, what was I trying to get out of this? And I was using some of the same language that I'm using now. I was asking, like, I was saying, this is my time to let, you know, the winds carry my soul, my soul to guide me. I was asking questions about how important my corporate career was versus some of my creative ambitions. At that time, I was doing improv at Second City here in Chicago. And I was kind of exploring this creative aspect of myself. And yet I felt this real tension because it's like, well, you know, our family doesn't do that. You know, we have real jobs with real paychecks and titles and business cards. And, and so I was, it was the early days of kind of exploring that tension <laughs> and letting right. myself go and do, you know, I went, I, you know, put this like human sized backpack on my back. <laughs> It was like, I, sh I, I literally, I, I have to show you the pictures at the time. I almost wanted to put pictures in the book because it's like this thing that's like three quarters the size of me that I'm like trotting around Europe with as I'm, you know, <laughs> trying to lighten my load, so to speak. <laughs> And um, yeah, it was really, and I did some volunteer work in Eastern Europe and it, it definitely, for me, it planted the seeds of falling in love with like the world, right? This is where my wanderlust, like I always knew I had wanderlust. I used to sit in my dad's office and spin the globe and see where my finger would land. And now I'm like out there meeting people from all over the place and learning about these distant lands like Australia that I'm dying <laughs> to go to, right? So <laughs> it was visit. a really, yeah, well, and I have been since, you know, then I hadn't been anywhere, right? I think London is the only place I had gone. And it was like, I was salivating. I had my first passport and I got to go to London and I'm like, well, that just feels like the amuse-bouche to this whole continent <laughs> that I need to explore, right? So that's what it was all about. And, and yet, it, what's interesting is where that ended is, I. so I said something that I think must have been straight from my soul and like channeled through my body when I was asking for this time off at the time. And I mean, how ballsy, like this 26 year old little mm -hmm. account manager walks in and says, I want to take some time off. And I had seen a friend model it. He's the same friend, by the way, who brought me into Harley Davidson many years later. Um, I had said, I have a feeling that this is the beginning of me like really wanting to go do something else in the world. Like I could be one of your kind of generals on the front lines and send me to the place no one else wants to go. And that was absolute like intention before I ever even spoke this language, I put it into the universe and I got a message near the end of my travels that said, I was working at McDonald's at the time, said, hey, we just won the McDonald's business in Turkey we'd love for you to go meet the president of the agency in Istanbul. Mm. And I was like, maybe this is the place no one else wants to go. And this is my call and it's time for wow. me to be courageous. So long story short at 26, I went back to Chicago. I flew to Istanbul. It was love at first sight. I loved the place. I loved how exotic everything was. I loved the agency. And I was like, why not? It's six months. So I mm. packed my entire life up into a storage container like packed one suitcase, you know, a dog-eared copy of Culture Shock Turkey, because I was like, <laughs> I don't even know where I'm going. And I just, and my passport, and I took off. And I didn't, I didn't come home until four years later. Yeah. Wow. It's amazing 
how the world sort of like, you know, just shows us things and sort of, you know, uh, responds to kind of what we're sometimes asking for. So it was a really, really interesting part of the book, actually, because um, what you mentioned there, like once you went to Turkey, like you're doing really, really well for yourself. Mm -hmm. Um, And then what what I found really interesting is you said as a single woman without like a male companion, uh, you're unable to kind of like venture into the Middle East for business purposes. Um, yeah. and, and, and that was your first exposure to feeling like less than, than your kind of male counterparts. So I was just wondering, like, how, how did you actually kind of handle feeling, I guess, vulnerable? Um, yeah. What was your, well, there were, there were so many layers of feeling vulnerable, you know, moving, moving to Turkey, moving to any place where you don't know the language at all you know, you automatically feel more vulnerable and more exposed. And so I was, you know, 26, single, moving to, you know, be an executive in an agency where, you know, in a, in a male dominated society, right. And, and in a place where I don't speak the language, I know absolutely no one. I didn't know one single person in the city of 20 million people. Right. So it was like vulnerability on top of vulnerability. And I I didn't really even know the word vulnerability at the time, right? So for me, it was just like my way of dealing in those situations is like, okay, well, I've got to get some sense of control. So I immediately started learning the Turkish language and, you know, I just, I found, I found my way. And then I started to get into additional situations. So when I initially went there, I was on, I was just trying to, I was basically building a team, building the client relationship with the the Turkish McDonald's organization. And I was just helping them kind of put like brand, you know, branding practices in place and get them on their merry way. And then I was supposed to go back home. Well, I fell in love, you know, fell in love with the Um, the people and the culture. And I just was like, I want more. So they offered me to stay. And so to answer your question, well, what led to that is they said, all right, well, what the agency would love for you to do is use Istanbul as a home base, but help us grow the McDonald's business in Southern Europe, North, South, North, South Africa. So I've spent plenty of time in South Africa (laughs) and um, Middle East and India. And so it was only, so I was going everywhere and I was just like, it was feeding my wanderlust. And it was like, oh my gosh, I'm living those days when I used to spin the globe. I'm going to all of these places now. So it was very odd to me when I think it was Saudi Arabia that came up in the conversation and McDonald's was making some inroads there. And I was like, well, of course, my bags are packed. I'm ready to go. Let's have this meeting. Let's do whatever. And I just remember like there was sort of these this silence on the other end of the line. And it was like, well, well, we can't exactly do that. We're going to send your boss. Well, my boss based in Vienna was a guy. He's also in the book. And, and I was like, well, why? And, or, or why, if he's going, then I'll go with him. And it was like, well, you know, you can't go in without a male companion. Now, the reality is you can jump through a million hoops and sometimes make it happen, but it just got to the point where it's so complicated. And it was like, well, you're basically a single unaccompanied female. And sometimes it works to be on business, but if they can serve up the man to go there and it's, the only time I felt like that in my life. And as you guys know, I've worked in very male dominated industries, most recently Harley Davidson, right? (laughs) So I've always been super comfortable, maybe too comfortable in that world because I kind of wore the same armor that guys wear, right? I I had a somewhat feminine approach to my leadership, but I was pretty armored up as a, as a human. So that was my first peek into well, what do you mean I can't go anywhere and do anything? And um, mm-hmm. it really bothered me. Like it's never left me. And there's a reason that it came through me and coming out in the book again. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's, um, is, isn't it amazing? Like we've come so far, yet we've still got so far to go, you know, in, in yeah. quite a few areas in life. I, I was just wondering, like in relation to that, like, you know, it's still in the workplace, it seems to be like quite a male dominated uh, sort of arena, should we say. But how, how can we either as males or just like, you know, both of us together as males and females, maybe empower a woman more in the workplace, do you feel? Oh, it's such a good, it's such a good question. I mean, interesting. I was listening to a conversation yesterday and, and this dialogue came up and, and it's, it's one. So one is let's just keep having the conversation. 
right? Mm -hmm. I think it starts with, let's not be afraid to have, it is the courageous conversation, right? To channel a little bit of Brene Brown, it's the courageous conversation to say, we need more diversity, right? Our businesses need to reflect our population. Leadership, you know, should reflect the people and the humans that we're serving, right? And that diverse perspective is only going to grow the pie, right? So I think having that conversation and being willing to support, I mean, one of the phrases that maybe has become a little cliche is collaboration over competition, but I believe it mm. in my heart and soul. And so another answer to that is how do we, how do we view each other and say, how do we collaborate? Right? Because it's the old adage, you know, um, you know, the, what was the one about the all old tides the, rising? The, the, all tides, yeah, yeah. The tide rises all boats, or mm. whatever that is. I know I'm yeah. butchering. Sorry, <laughs> um, but that that I think is very true. So if we're all looking at it from that perspective, how does our collaboration and wanting diversity and inclusion and creating cultures that uh, corporate cultures in particular that favor that? That's how. So I think it's men and women right? Mm. All, all colors and creeds and ethnicities, and it doesn't matter. Let's all be in this conversation. And that, this is one of the reasons why, why I love the work that Brene Brown does. When you look at her, you know, I've, I've studied her Dare to Lead work. I'm, a, I'm certified in the work. And it really drives this conversation around what wholehearted leadership looks like and what braver cultures look like. Mm. And I think the braver cultures, it's both and the braver cultures piece gets so much at what you're saying, right? Let's really get vulnerable. Let's get courageous. Let's have the difficult conversations. Let's look each other in the eye and sit next to each other at the table mm. instead of across from each other. Mm. Let's collaborate versus compete. I mean, all of that still feels like we're, we're just starting to scratch the surface. It doesn't feel like it's happening enough. Mm. Mm. Great I love advice. that it's framed in a brave, in a, a sort of a, a bravery sense, because that it, it does take actually a lot of guts to sit down like that and, and talk about these things and look one another in the eye. And even though it's super uncomfortable, and I think it's just a lot easier for people to look the other way. And something that Gareth and I have, have chatted about um, before is that it's kind of the, the difficult road to navigate there is sometimes how do you take responsibility for spilt milk in the past, especially as, mm -hmm. as two guys, you know, like we have some responsibility, even though we don't feel like we did it. You know what I mean? It's not our fault now, but we, we are part of that somehow of that piece. So I think that's, it's um, at least starting from a place of talking and bravery is, is a good start and, and just accepting that we are part of something bigger, you know? Yeah, and I, I love that you guys are, that you even asked the question so that we could have this conversation because that, that fuels further conversation that you guys are, I think curiosity is a superpower, mm. right? And I think that fits in here as well. I mean, to me, that is a through line of how I love, how I want to live and what I try to inspire in other people. But think about just saying, I don't know, or sitting down with somebody, maybe who you don't know anything about, or maybe you feel intimidated by them, or you don't really understand what they're doing in their role, sit down and get curious. Just say, mm. I'm, you know, I'd love to hear this from your perspective, or maybe it's actually somebody who you really disagree with on a topic. Instead of digging your heels in, you know, and doing mm. the thing we like to do as humans, just sitting down and saying, hey, I definitely see this in a different way, but I'm really curious about your perspective. Tell me more. To me, that's so beautiful because it automatically diffuses a situation and it helps us see each other as humans instead of getting mm. really caught up in like, you know, the, you know, I, I don't even want to talk to you about this because it's unraveling me. So their <laughs> curiosity plays a really, really important role in this, I think. Mm -hmm. Sure, I love that. <laughs> so, Shelly, you, you kept on uh, during this journey um, of, of being in the corporate world and that you, you kept on making personal sacrifices in exchange for, so to say, work titles. And, and one of these sacrifices was your health. And uh, at one point, you weighed over 200 pounds and then you got some crazy bacterial infection too. Um, why do you think that so many people do this um, and not just you, obviously? 
Oh yeah. Well, this is, I mean, my, my lesson for myself and what I see, you know, in, in, you know, a lot of people right now is especially people who are in a situation like I was where it's, we're pretending not to know, right? So this is the universe sending us signals and signs. You know, we are so many of us, especially very driven people. We live up here in our heads and we're completely disconnected from our bodies. And our bodies are where the real intelligence is. Our bodies are where the intuition lives, right? In our body and in our soul. And instead we choose to just play up here above our shoulders. And there was no doubt in my mind as I look back at it now, I was ignoring every single sign that my body was sending me along the way. It was just like, you know, a neon blinking emergency sign. And I was just like, I can power through this. I'm strong. I'm tough. And part of it was my upbringing. That's what we were taught to do, right? We just get through this stuff. So that's what I think, you know, I see now. It's like one of my favorite questions to my coaching clients or even in speaking engagements is to just say, what are you pretending not to know? <laughs> because we have this little voice. Every single one of us has this little voice inside us you know this the voice of intuition is really the voice of our soul and it's always trying to talk to us but if we're not sitting still and we're not getting into our bodies and we're not listening we're missing it so it's finding other ways to just grab us by the lapels mm -hmm. <laughs> and shake us silly right and that's what was happening to me. So, you know, I wasn't treating myself very well because I was, as you said, I was making those, those sacrifices and I was paying handsomely. I like to say now that I was sacrificing soul for salary. Hmm. Hmm. And I think it's a really slippery slope. It's dangerous. Yeah, yeah fully. It, it so, certainly is. And like, um, yeah, it, it's amazing how many kind of people go down that slippery slope, you know, and they don't actually have somebody to maybe kind of tell them and to reflect like, you know, kind of, this is what's going on. You kind of, you know, you need to pull that parachute a little bit so you can get out of there. Um, yeah. So I'm glad that, uh, you know, somebody like yourself has written an amazing book like you have. And, you know, hopefully it'll be that reflection point for somebody. So um, and it already is. I, mm. I'm getting notes from people, some whom I know, some, you know, who heard about this book from somebody connected to my circle. And it feels so beautiful. Like, I don't care about book sales. I just want this message to get out. I want people to hear my story and know it's possible. Right. Mm. On the other side of this, the beautiful rewards and the richness that comes from living true to yourself and comes from, you know, pushing through the discomfort of being courageous. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Super valuable stuff. So, um, yeah. yeah. So, so when you were in Turkey, uh, you, you met, um, your ex-husband, um, my future ex-husband, yeah, like, ex like, you, you know, like I laughed at that when I read that. I thought, oh, that's a good one. <laughs> um, and his name was, uh, well, it's John Don, if I'm John Don, John exactly. Don, yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, it's uh, it's definitely spelt a lot differently to that. That's for sure. Um, so you guys went through a, a lot together, um, you know, including terminating yeah. a pregnancy, um, yeah. and and unfortunately ended up like in a kind of an extremely uh, messy divorce um and even though w when you guys got divorced you were sort of staying in the same house um and you fell into depression um partly as a result of that uh you also tried to take a drug, drug overdose and commit suicide so those were pretty dark times for you i uh, gather yeah there's a lot in there well it was so that is a combination of what started off as very bright times so that whole span of time was about 11 years what you mm -hmm. just articulated so from meeting john don which by the way his name in turkish means from the soul so here i am thinking like this is like the universe telling me like this is my guy because i was already starting to kind of speak soul language and I just really thought, and that is how our relationship started. And it was very, very beautiful for a long time. So I don't know where he is. I don't, I, I have no clue. I think he's back in Turkey. I don't know if this book will ever get to him. I've tried to be fair and saying, hey, this is my, you know, version of the story. And I, you know, and everybody's going to have a bit of a different version of the story. Mm -hmm. But I do want to say we had many beautiful years together. 
and we grew and we traveled and it was big, a big adventure and we moved to New York City together, which is a place we had both dreamed of living. So what started out is like, oh my gosh, I have absolutely met my life partner. Definitely took a turn <laughs> several years later. But it's, it wouldn't be fair for me to not say that. And I do say that in the book, right? Mm-hmm. Like, yeah. I, I, you know, I kind of fast forward through it a little bit. Um, but when things started to go south, you know, I was getting all these signs from the universe because I was, I was getting sick. You know, I got really, really sick from living in, in Shanghai and was sick for about a year and being treated at the Mayo Clinic. And that gave me a, a, a renewed perspective on life. You know, when you kind of are like, Uh, thinking like, I don't know if I'm going to lose my life or my quality of life. Like I really couldn't eat food and it was nuts. So it really made me think about what do I want out of life? And at the same time, he was headed in a very different direction. He was like really becoming very, um, I don't, I don't know. He was just sort of disenfranchised by, you know, the pursuit of life, liberty, and happiness, you know, the, the dream, the U S dream, the American dream. And he was just kind of giving up on all of it. So I was headed in this place of like, life is full of possibility. I'm going to start taking it seriously. And like the maybe initial stages of me realizing that I had some work to do on myself and he was headed in the exact opposite direction. And so once that all started to unravel, it was very ugly. And it, that definitely led to a lot of darkness because the divorce became um, way messier than I ever thought it was going to be. I, I guess maybe naively, I had hoped that we could work through this in a very emotionally mature adult way. And it just didn't go that, that way for a whole mm. variety of reasons. So, um, yeah, I, so I, I made this decision, you know, it wasn't even a pre-planned thing, just talking about this, this, you know, attempted suicide, you know, I wasn't, I just was, I was getting to this place where I felt this deep depression. I honestly didn't feel like I was going to see the light. I couldn't see the light at the end of the tunnel. And day by day, this divorce was just like becoming messier and messier. And there was like, you know, masking tape down the middle of my life because we were t- dividing everything. And it was, oh, it was, it was very ugly. And so at that time, I think the important thing to talk about here is I didn't know how to ask for help. Mm-hmm. And it's a message that, you know, I, it was really important to me to tell this story one, because, you know, as Brene Brown says, you know, shine a spotlight on shame, right? And then sh- the shame monster can't live anymore. And I realized that I'd been living with a lot of shame because I tried to kill myself. And like, I only told like five people in my life, my family, because they ended up in a hospital by my bedside, almost losing me. And a couple of really close friends at that time. And I kept that really tucked inside. And now I, the, the book is the first place where I'm publicly saying this. And now I want to speak about it because I didn't feel like I, I had, I, I didn't know what it meant to be vulnerable. I didn't know how to ask for help because I'd been taught that we just do this stuff and we somehow get through it. And I just got to this very desperate place of like, instead of trying to get through it, I just thought the easiest way to peace was to get out of it, meaning get out mm-hmm. of life. Mm-hmm. And so I want people to know like there is help. And you can get through it. And if I can be a lifeline in that sense, if it's, you know, any number of um, suicide hotlines, like there is help out there, have the conversation. Don't be ashamed to have the conversation. So I want to get that out into, you know, into the world. And I want to share my story in hopes that it will inspire others who might be feeling that and maybe being quiet about it and feeling Mm. some shame around it. And for me, it's so important that 10% of the proceeds that I get from selling this book are going to the Life is Priceless Foundation, which is a foundation set up in the honor of a friend of mine who did successfully commit suicide about eight years ago. And his brother set up this, his name is David Price, and his brother set up the Life is Priceless Foundation, which supports mental health awareness and research and suicide prevention. And so I've made a commitment that I, one, want to serve those causes. I want to be speaking more about it. And I want to be there for people. Mm. Jeez. 
how how does it how does it feel now like to to speak about that more you know like to kind of almost get rid of that tag you know that shame tag yeah. that you were carrying for such a long time liberating mm. liberating and really empowering i mean this this book you know it has been such a healing it has been such a healing journey more so than i could have ever imagined and I think there is, there is such power in writing your story, whether you share it with others or not, there's power in just, in just processing it and working and working through it. And so for me to say it now and know that it's coming from my heart and my soul, and it's just I, I, me wanting to share this with other people to say, I got you because, and that's where I start the book. If you remember in the introduction to the book, I'm like, I just wish somebody would have put an arm around me when I walked away from this big, sexy corporate job and people were telling me I was absolutely crazy. And I was like, I know I'm not because I'm listening to my soul and it's telling me that it's neglected and it's dying. And yet I had no way to explain that to people. And so I feel like my pay it forward is me writing this story and getting this out into the world and putting you know the virtual arm around people and sharing the good the bad and the ugly the dark and the light of what i've been through and um that makes me smile inside and out that i feel is part of my purpose in this world and this journey was meant to teach me that that's so powerful so Shelly, actually you mentioned it there a little bit talking about, you know, the, the success you had achieved. So you, you know, you were in this job that was sort of the epitome of success and you were the CMO of Harley Davidson, which is pretty cool. And you know, everything company. from the, uh, <laughs> everything from the outside, uh, you know, all the boxes, that, boxes had been ticked basically. And, um, but on the inside, as you said, you were, you were dying, actually, you were just having a horrible time. And, um, so basically, you, but you pushed through and you, you were drinking a bit in excess and, and eating. Um, but this is something that a lot of people do, I think, is it, you know, you thought that your twice yearly, month long detox and totally. uh, <laughs> would sort of do the trick. Um, but then come day 31 and you were, you were back on it and, and back at it, you know. Um, so basically, you know, a recurring nightmare sort of, uh, sort of formed, I'd imagine. And is this something that sort of kicked off the path, you know, that you're on now? Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, you know, I, I, um, I, I invented a phrase. So, you know, my food and drink have always been my go-tos. Like when the stress, when things get crazy or the things that I just don't want to deal with, you know, so I, I said, you know, we've become ninjas of numbing. And I was a total ninja of numbing and food and drink were my choices, right? But we have so many choices, right? And, and so that's one of the things that I've been reflecting on is in what ways was I numbing so that I didn't have to come to terms with clearly this message that my soul and the universe were trying to send me. So I was, you know, creating that cushion and creating that, you know, I was dulling myself so I didn't have to deal with it. And, and yeah, it, it was, uh, so that's what I, that's, you know, that's what, that's what I did. And then. I think finally, it kind of goes back to what I was saying earlier, like, you know, the universe whispers, you know, you can say the universe, you can say your soul, right? Like your, your little voice is like whispering and then it's kind of talking at a normal, you know, a normal volume and then it's shouting at you and then it's literally like <laughs> shaking you. <laughs> and so I feel like this nightmare that I started to have was like that that escalation where it was just like, okay, enough already. You're not listening. You're not paying attention. You're continuing to just get, you're getting worse. And we are going to just rip you out of your sleep, sleep quite literally. And that's when I started having the nightmare and I would wake up. I mean, it literally was five times a week that I was ripped out of my sleep. I would wake up bawling, soaking wet, like in my bed, like shaking and crying. And every time I had seen the exact same sequence of events and they all ended with me walking into this dark room and to find another closet in this very dark room. And in this closet, I was finding my dog who had passed away three weeks before my divorce was finalized, which was about five or six years prior to this moment. And I discover in this nightmare that my dog is still alive, but he'd been in this closet 
and I had been the monster who'd been neglecting him. I never knew he was alive. I wasn't taking care of him. He was barely alive and able to lift his head up. He was completely malnourished. His little, he was, he was a fat pug in the day. And like his wrinkles were all spread out on the floor. And it just wrecked me every time I would see that image. And so it really started to play with my mind because I put my dog to, to sleep because he was so sick. And, and he was actually kind of the guardian angel of our, of our marriage. And so we got him when we got married and he died three weeks before we got divorced. So talk about another wow. message from the universe, which still like makes the hair on my, on my arms stand up. Um, and so, yeah, I, I, it started to really mess with my head. And I was like, why am I seeing this? Why am I seeing this? Like it, it is like, is this that I'm a monster? I haven't cared for my dog. Like he's alive. I've been neglecting him. And then I got introduced to, um, well, actually a doctor at the Harley Davidson's executive physical program who we would go visit once a year. I told him, cause I finally broke down was like, I have to tell somebody the story. I'm kind of losing my mind because at that point now I'm stressed out. I'm working 14 plus hour days. I'm not getting any sleep at night because I'm afraid to go to sleep. And then I get woken up in the middle of the night. I'm drinking it all away. I mean, I was creating this like perfect storm of insanity. And then, so I finally said to him, like, here's, here's the story. And he's the one who got me into meditation. I had never done meditation. And he was like, you have what we call monkey mind. And so you need to read these things and you need to start meditating. Just start with 10 minutes. And it was honestly through doing that. So I picked up the Headspace app at the time and I got myself the subscription to it. And I listened listen to Andy's awesome, you know, sexy British voice, you know, kind of like, you know, introduced me to meditation. And it was through that, that I started to understand the message that this nightmare was trying to tell me because I started to see and hear these phrases in a pattern over, over, over and over again. It was acknowledge me, nurture me, listen to me, love me. And I would literally start chanting this. I was like, what hmm. is this? And then months later, one time, I literally saw like my young, healthy pug and then me as a child, like carefree, the, you know, the me that, you know, danced wildly and didn't worry about anything. And I suddenly got it, that this was hmm. my soul that was begging for attention and love and being nurtured. And that was the begin, beginning of me paving the exit ramp, essentially hmm. to leave, leave that position. And I didn't know if I would ever end up in corporate America again. I had no plan other than to, my business plan literally was, you're becoming chief soul officer of your life. You're going on a journey called soulbatical because these were things that kind of came to me as I got more clear on this idea. And your intention, at least in the beginning, is simply to nurture your creative soul. And maybe if you get, you become true to yourself again and things you truly love to do, which for me were travel and writing and photography, then maybe that will guide you. That will get you back into relationship with your soul and guide you to whatever is meant to be. And that's where it all started. That was three and a half years ago. Sure. Wow. So interesting. Eh? Like dreams, I mean, dreams, I think are fascinating to, to begin with, you know, and like uh, what you actually mentioned in, in the book was, you know, when you're in your waking hours is when you kind of like had that armor on and you were like really, really strong and you could deal with things. But it was when you were asleep that kind of, I guess the armor was off is when you would obviously have the dream. And that's when it could kind of like, sort of like, start sending you a message and kind of, um, yeah, just, and, and then, and then uh, while you were saying this about the actual dream and I didn't think about it while reading the book, but now I was like, I was w wondering, and it sounds like maybe a weird thing to say, but it's almost like that little dog, you know, was you in a way, you know, like this, uh, it, it, you know what I mean? Like it's, um, it really kind of fascinating how our dreams kind of tell us things. I think, you know, who knows what they actually oh, mean true. a lot of the time, but like, it's a, uh, it's a fascinating subject. Well, there's no doubt because I was neglecting myself entirely. Right. Mm. I mean, it's not like I didn't look ragged from the outside. Like I did a great job of like spit polishing the armor. <laughs> Let's mm. be honest. Right. I was, I put on a really good show because I, you know, I'm like, 
you know, I have, I have my style and I rock this kind of like, you know, rocker girl thing. And at mm -hmm. Harley, that was great. Like I walked into boardrooms and like my boots and my skinny jeans and leather jackets and a pierced nose. And like, I was just like ready to go for it. So I had that whole thing down pat. But on the inside, I mean, had anybody, had my insides been on the outside, I, I don't think mm. people would have wanted to talk to me because it was, it was really, yeah, it was really, it was really messy. It was very messy. And I didn't yet know, and this is why I love so much of what you guys do and, and the stories that you're putting out into the world in this podcast, because this is about us getting messy as humans mm. and learning to be uncomfortable with that messiness. And I didn't know how to be messy. You know, I'd only ever taught that you, you know, been taught to have it all together. And at least from the outside, you know, have sort of the Instagram version, you know, it's like mm -hmm. the filtered version of your life for people to see. Mm -hmm. And I think that gets us in a lot of trouble because being disingenuous to ourselves creates so much tension and illness. And, you know, mm -hmm. I think a lot of divisiveness in the world as well. And what yeah. you mentioned there as well is like what you've been told to do is, is a, is a powerful part of that piece. There is like those patterns and the blueprints you receive from your parents. And when, when you went back and nurtured, you know, your, your, that yourself in, in some weird way and your inner child, like that, that young you that was really uncomfortable with your parents and all the stuff they yes. were talking to you and all those things that freed you now, which I think is, is really powerful to sort of for people to do as well. Yeah, it 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 dawned on me recently in a in a conversation that you know part of the reason why we're so disconnected just in general in the world, yes, technology has something to do with it because it's you know it's putting these barriers in between us, but I also have this belief that it's because we first need to connect with ourselves in order to connect with others. And so many people are where I was. I wasn't at all connected to myself. So I was kind of having these disingenuous connections with other people. And now I have these deep, real, vulnerable connections with other humans because I'm, I'm being honest to myself and I'm being true to myself. So I think we have to, you know, I say as a chief soul officer, you know, we look inward, not outward. We look inward, not upward. And I think that's really important as part of this journey. You know, I was always looking outward and upward. That was where my gaze was. And actually inward is where, where the struggle was. It was where the origin of the problem was. Yeah, absolutely. It certainly is like an inside job, that's for sure. So, um, totally. but, but, but just before we kind of like move on to, to the rest of the story, I was just wondering, is there like, you know, like working for Harley Davidson, like, now let's be honest, that's flipping cool. You know what I mean? And yeah. <laughs> chief marketing officer for, for them as well. Like, I was just wondering, are there any like, like super cool stories or any cool connections or anything like you could tell us about? Like, I mean, one, maybe like something around Hell's Angels. Is there any connection there with the, you know what I mean? It just sounds like, it's like, I, I don't think we could finish this podcast or, you know, uh, without asking you or hearing some cool stories about Harley. Oh, it's really funny that you said Hell's Angels, and I'm not sure I should tell that story. Um, well, whatever. I can say anything on this, right? Yeah. yeah. So, so I will say, um, we, don't, we don't have kids listening. I think ad adults <laughs> will, will appreciate this or at least laugh at it. Before I say the Hell's Angels story, um, you know what? It was such a blessing. Like I don't have a single regret from the entire 26 year corporate career. It served me so well and it took me around the world and it fueled my soul in so many different ways. Right. And it served me until it didn't. And to be able to, you know, to kind of have ended my corporate career as a marketer working for one of the most iconic brands on the planet that people tattoo on their bodies. Mm. Yeah. It doesn't get any better than that. Right. It's, it was, I mean, I, I had on paper pretty much the, the epitome of the se sexiest, coolest job in, <laughs> in the marketing world for sure. So that made it, you know, even, even a little, look a little crazier when I decided that I was going to walk, that I was going to walk away. And, and so the other piece is 
it was a really cool job. You know, that this is, I always say to people, this isn't about Harley Davidson and it's only a little bit about the corporate world because I would love that part of this mission I'm on is to rewrite the script of success and also start to shift culture. But let's be honest, I got to ride motorcycles around the world. I've ridden <laughs> motorcycles in Brazil, you know, Gareth, where you're sitting right now. You know, I've ridden motorcycles in Brazil. I've ridden motorcycles in Australia. I've ridden from, you know, Austria through the Alps all the way to Amsterdam. I have ridden, I've ridden motorcycles. I've ridden motorcycles in, um, uh, around, in and around kind of the, the Durban area and down in South <laughs> Africa because South African Bike Week is down in Durban. So I say that, so that's like a pastiche of stories, meaning, I feel so privileged and so honored that I got to do what I got to do. And I never want anybody to take away from my story that I'm in any way kind of shitting on Harley or my corporate experience because, man, I think of all the corporate careers one could have, I had an amazing one. It doesn't really get any better than that. And so some of it was, you know, I was just coming to terms with the fact that I just wasn't being honest with myself and that I had a bigger calling in this world. Um, and some of it is, you know, a mission to rewrite, you know, the corporate culture. Um, so I will say before we move on, yeah, I had, I have so many stories. I mean, we could literally do a four hour podcast with me just telling you guys Harley stories. Um, but the, uh, where were we? We were at, um, there is a European Bike Week event uh, that takes place in Austria. It's in um, a little, uh, a little tiny town and a little lake called Fak am See. So it's called Fakersee, which sounds dirty, but it's, you know, clean. Um, <laughs> the story is not that clean. So at Fakersee, you get like people from all over Europe are descending upon this, you know, idyllic little, you know, kind of like mountain village. And it just becomes Harley HQ. Harley started the event and it's people on all different kinds of motorcycles, but it's very Harley dominant. And even the Hells Angels show up to this event. And so this was my very first trip. I had started at Har Harley exactly four weeks. I didn't even ride a motorcycle at this point. So I was riding on the back mm -hmm. of people's motorcycles because I didn't have my license yet. And four weeks into this, so I am learning this culture and I'm getting to know these people and I am like, oh my God, right? And suddenly I'm in the thick of it all. And I'm feeling like a bit of an imposter if I'm honest, because I'm sort of like, what am I doing in this world? And like, are they just going to be like, who invited her? <laughs> like, <laughs> what, you know, why, what credibility does she have to be at the time I was like second in command. And anyway, I tell you all this. So late one night were friends, one, some of the people I worked with who had like started the event, they were like, come on, we want to like show you, you know, a special part. They take us over to this tent and we walk in and it is like basically a massive Hells Angels tent that has been converted to like a stripper bar. <laughs> <laughs> so here I am having this complete out of body experience. I'm like, I'm in the Alps in Austria wow. at this mega motorcycling <laughs> event with thousands of riders, including the Hells Angels. And now I'm like watching a stripper perform on my table. <laughs> right? it's like I'm getting every aspect uh, of, of Viking, right? And I was just like, this is the like this is what some people want. This is part of the experience. And you also end up meeting the nicest guys and realizing that some of these people who are associated with you know, gangs and, and things like the Hells Angels, while yes, there's a reputation and some danger there, there's a lot of just really big hearted people. Mm. And so the one of the things I absolutely loved about Harley was it felt like a democratization of humanity hmm. because we found this like commonality and this passion and this desire for freedom and self-expression and all of the things that this brand stands for. And that felt purposeful to me. And that's what kept me there for six and a half years because I'm like, that's a language I speak. That's what I want to be promoting out in the world. And in a weird way, I think I learned so much from Harley and how Harley does that. And I'm now parlaying it into speaking my own language in a very similar movement because it is self-expression and purpose and freedom. And there's a lot, you know, you probably, I mean, you read in my book, 
as I was on this journey, I started to realize so much of what I had learned in motorcycling was applicable to this journey that I was on, right? And it's like leaning into turns and, you know, really like getting into that space of discomfort. And I was like, oh yeah, there were a lot of lessons there. Now I'm seeing them in a completely different perspective. And it's really cool. Like it, it, it gave me there were many, many gifts being associated with that brand for as long as I was. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, I got to meet the Hells Angels in a stripper tent. So, I mean, who wow. has that story? <laughs> that should go in the next book. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> and not least of which uh, was a little bit of uh, rebellion as well. Like uh, that, that side of you definitely could come out there with that brand, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, for sure. And it's one of the reasons, you know, I was hired to be a change agent. You know, I was brought in by somebody who knew me well and actually loved the fact that I wasn't steeped in the motorcycle or the automotive industry mm. and that I could bring that fresh perspective and that I could, you know, stand strong with, with these people because, you know, there's, there is a lot of judgment, you know, of riders versus non-riders and going, walking into that company as a non-rider was very, very vulnerable for me. Mm-hmm. So yeah. at this uh, sort of stage, your financial advisor, Dominic, um, <laughs> had been uh, waiting for a call from you to see if you had enough cash in your fuck you fund uh, mm-hmm. to leave your job. Um, why is it important to have one of these funds and what money saving tips maybe do you have for, um, for our listeners? Oh, that's a good one. Um, so, you know, I mean, the, the fuck you fun, I'll, I'll put a little context around that, right? So it may sound really crass and, and it was, you know, I, everything I do and I do love, I do love the F word. So um, I've been trying to use it sparingly in this conversation, <laughs> but you know, I, I, to me, so the fuck you fund, like the, the genesis of that was post-divorce. So my divorce was pretty financially devastating and because I was the breadwinner. And so I almost had sort of the, what is the typically male experience in a divorce? And I just, I felt like, oh my God, I've worked so hard for so many years. And, and to see like, you know, overnight half my retirement gone, half my savings gone, everything. And I was really gutted by the whole thing. And so I, found, I I asked a bunch of friends, like actually senior women who I really looked up to. I said, I know I have to really take seriously kind of the rebuilding of my nest egg and what that's going to look like. And so I was introduced to Dominic at that time. And I remember going into him and I was kind of feeling very sheepish about the whole thing because I was like, well, I'm not, you know, I know how much money these other people have and this is what I have left. (laughs) It felt Mm -hmm. like I was, you know, sort of like cradling the few dollars that I had left. And I said, can you help me? And here's my vision. And I said, at the time I had just accepted the Harley, the Harley role. And so I knew that I was, I was like going into really prime earning years. And so I wanted to be smart about how I was approaching it. And I wanted to be really proactively thoughtful about it. And so, but then with a wink and a smile, which is what I usually do, right? Because I'm like, I just can't take life and myself too seriously, right? It's too short. And so with a wink and a smile, I was like, you know, because I want to deliver a little fuck you to my ex-husband, right? So it was sort of a fuck you for leaving me in this position. But it was also fuck you to anything less than fulfillment in the future. And I said, so for me, this isn't going to be my entire retirement. This isn't all my investments in the market, but I slowly but surely want to be putting some money into this little, you know, into this little fund and allow it to grow. So I have a cushion when I need a cushion whatever that looks like. And so that is advice that I would give to people. (laughs) Maybe calling it a fuck you fund will feel a little edgy for people and that's okay. Give it whatever name lights that fire inside of you. So for me, that really got me going and that made me want to put money away and save and it got me really energized. So whatever that is for somebody else, but give it a name that's like really is gravity and meaning to you. And then slowly but surely just put a little bit of money away every month. That's what I did. It was like drips over time. And in the six and a half years that I was at Harley, I put enough into that fund that I was able to say, you know what? If I made no money in this year of my sabbatical, I'll be okay, right? I'm not independently wealthy. I'm not ready to retire. I'm not financially able to retire, right? I'm not financially independent. But 
it'll give me this little cushion to explore me and to nurture my soul and to see where this leads. And so that's, you know, that's kind of my, my gift and my tip to everybody listening is what's your version of that, right? That when you get to the point where it's like, you can't pretend not to know and the voice is getting really loud and you're realizing that, you know, your soul is still in the clutches of your ego, which is basically what I realized, you're able to do something about it. Mm. And by the way, one of my, my learnings in the entire journey was that sabbatical is actually not about leaving your job. It's about finding yourself. My decision was extreme. I decided to leave my job because I really needed, I knew I needed to be in stillness and I really wanted to explore my passions. And I was curious where that was going to lead within this particular period of time. And it may look very different for somebody else, but you know, having a fund creates some space and it takes away some of that anxiety and that worry that I know, you know, finances are usually the number one excuse for people not doing something that they're really passionate about. Mm -hmm. So yeah, yeah, it gives you a little bit of runway. I say mm -hmm. runway. It's like I gave myself like, you know, the runway to invest in the possibility of my future self. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Super important. Eh? And I think, uh, I think uh, I, li I like the distinction that you made is that it's not about leaving your corporate job. You know what I mean? It's uh, it could be, it, it depends on what actually kind of looks good for you and, and kind of suits you and stuff. And I think there are a lot of people that are stuck in the corporate world that feel that they need to go into entrepreneurship and, and kind of make that, that, um, yeah. that escape. Uh, but it's not always maybe the, the right thing, you know, depending on the person it might entrepreneurship might not be the thing for you because it's not as easy as it seems. And as you well speak about you, you said the transition was like uh, wildly challenging. Um, so for those people that are looking to make that leap from uh, corporate to entrepreneurship, besides the say, fuck you fund, what other, uh, like say two bits of advice or three bits of advice would you sort of recommend to those people? Yeah, I think there's kind of a stage before that, because what, one of the things I say is like, there are as many flavors of sabbatical as there are humans on this planet. So I think it's really important to know that sabbatical is like an ethos and a philosophy. It's a way of being in the world that says, I am living and leading more authentically, more courageously, and more on purpose. So for me, there's even before you make those decisions, there's some work to do. So I always say to people, like, start getting really, really clear on what does light your soul on fire. Go inward a little bit and spend some time with yourself. That's why I wrote the book as kind of an interactive guide as well. So you're not only reading my story, but then at the end of each section, there are soul search reflection questions so that you can then turn the mirror on yourself. Because my story, I know, is really sparking a lot in people. And then it's like, great, now spend some time with these questions and really start to get honest with yourself, right? I mean, one of my favorite questions is like, what would change in your life if you were being 100% true to you right now? Mm -hmm. Like, That's a big one. Big one. Yeah. And so, so I think my, my guidance is, you know, one, I mean, by the book, because it's also a workbook for you to say, to even get clear on your, who you are and what you really want and what values you, you hold dear, right? I don't even know that I was super clear on my values before I went down this path. And as part of this work, I mean, two big things. One, I had a complete identity crisis. I was a mess. I sat in a, you know, a little cottage in New Zealand and had a massive meltdown because I realized how attached I was, or I should say how intertwined the Shelly Paxton identity and her business identity, meaning big, sexy brands, big, sexy titles, big, sexy paycheck. Um, so there's a lot of work to do. So first I would say, spend time to get clear on even what's the, you know, who, who are you? 
Get clear on your identity. Get clear on your values. Ask yourself some of these really provocative questions so you kind of even know, like, where do you want to go? Because it might not be, maybe it's simply, you know what? I'm just not in a, I want to be in a corporate environment. I'm comfortable with that, but I'm not working in a company or in a, in a role that's aligned with my values. Hmm. So it might be that kind of shift. It might be a shift to entrepreneurship. It might be, who knows? It might be a shift to doing something in the arts world. I mean, there are so many beautiful ways that this could play out that are going to look different for, you know, each one of us. And that's what I want people to do. Like, this is really just a, it's a framework for a way of being in the world that's just more true to you. And frankly, a more ballsy way of living, right? Mm -hmm. This is, this is kind of a playbook for playing big in the world. And so big. I mean, one of the questions I ask in the book is what's calling you to play so big? You scare the shit out of yourself. <laughs> yeah. I like that a lot. Yeah, I think the biggest, that's I think such where the a, edge is. Yeah. Just being ballsy is accepting that you might have a different take on your life than it is right now and, mm -hmm. and actually owning that. And I think that's already pretty ballsy because you go like, wow, that, this, this might not actually be what I really want. And, and that's kind of scary, uh, actually. So, well, especially when it looks so shiny on the outside. Mm -hmm. Like for me to say, this job, which is the pinnacle of success in the marketing world for a lot of people, and people will give their right arm for the job that I have, isn't making me feel true to myself on the inside, is super scary to admit. To first to admit to yourself, right? Because that's kind of the first sale is like, you have to believe that. And then secondly, to start openly saying that and taking action on it in the world. Yeah, massive. Thanks for sharing those. I think those are super valuable tips. And uh, once again, just start on the inside. That's it's got to just start. It's got to come from there. Hey? Don't look at other people's examples. You, 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 you're the first prime example for yourself. It's, it's such good yeah. advice. And talking more about your book, there, Shelley, actually, you know, sabbatical. Um, and you mentioned uh, it's a bit of a breakdown in New Zealand. But it also sort of is a result of a trip to France and California. Uh, and it was eventually a writing retreat in Carmel where uh, you actually got into this whole idea. Um, what exactly uh, do you do at a writing retreat uh, besides sort of the obvious? Um, it, is, it is a whole lot of the obvious, right? <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, it's beautiful in the sense that, you know, writing retreat is designed to get you out of your day to day and give you the space and, you know, the beautiful space to write and to be with other like-minded souls who are also writing and then to be able to use each other as sounding boards to on the work that you're doing. So there's a huge component. I guess there are two components that are super helpful there well there are three pieces let's say one is you're going there to spend some time head down writing you're going there to meet other people who are on the same journey almost all of whom are writing a book and you're able to be sounding boards and reflect back to each other and three the woman who runs the retreat is quite well known in the space she has uh, the beautiful writers podcast her name is linda sievertson um, she's a beautiful writer's podcast, the beautiful writer's group. She's a published author. She calls herself book mama. So she's like a book midwife, which I love. I just <laughs> think that concept is so cool. And funny enough, so this is another tie to Mandy. Mandy had gone to one of her retreats the prior year. And as she was working on her, her book and her book proposal, and she had such an incredible experience, when I started talking about doing this, she said, you have to talk to Linda. And sure enough, because I love to, you know, like follow in Wendy, Mandy's wake, um, I, I went out there and it was incredible. It's very small. It's a very intimate. There are only five women who go and then Linda, you know, leads you. And so... I, I just kind of had this kernel of an idea because what I had started to do is to get back in touch with my writing. Writing is something that I've always loved to do, but quite frankly, as I say in the book, it's like, 
you know, I didn't do a whole lot of it. I really became an expert at putting, you know, bullet points on PowerPoint slides, which is a really sad thing to say. <laughs> But it was truth. And I know a lot of people can relate to that because that seems to be the language of the corporate world. You know, it's like distill everything into bullet points. And I really lost touch with my own authentic voice and my way of creating language and expressing myself. And that's a lot of what I did in New Zealand as well. As I just started, I would give myself little assignments on essays or write something about my childhood, you know, one of these, one of the essays I wrote is use not fat, use fluffy. And I told the story and actually part of the story made it into the book, I told the story about when I was young, probably around the, you know, not, not too far away from the knife chasing days. <laughs> My mom gave me this little, you know, I think it was like an olive branch, but it was, it was a, a sheep a you know, a U. it was like a little wooden plaque carved out and on it, it said, use not fat, use fluffy, like as a way to build my confidence. And I was like, that's the worst parenting ever. <laughs> but what I realized is like in that, I would find the humor in that because humor has always been my thing, right? I think it's, it's, you know, it's, it's the light side and the dark side for me. And I started to just mine that story. I'm like, what's really going on there? How did I feel? And I wrote a whole essay around that. So I took pieces of writing like that with me to Carmel just to start to present to the group to say, I think I have something interesting here. And it's all under this heading of soul radical and going on this inner journey. Um, you know, because part, let's be honest, like one of the things that I think is, is, is so interesting is because I love to travel, travel featured heavily in my initial sabbatical journey until my dad had his strokes. And I realized very quickly, it's like the power of place can feed your soul, but it can't fix it. That's mm. our work. <laughs> and so I tell people, I'm like, sabbatical is also not about, you know, it's not eat, pray, love. It's not going to find, you know, you're not looking for yourself somewhere else. You find yourself in here. So you can find that stillness in your own home. You can find that stillness in the national park closest to you. You can find that stillness, putting your feet in the sand by the water, whatever it is for you. And I do find that being outside and connected to nature, like just mm -hmm. inspires you with some sort of divine truth. I very much felt that way when I was writing and when I was on um, the initial leg of Solvatical. Um, so anyway, I brought a lot of those ideas into this group to say, you know, what do I do with this? It feels like I have a book. And then suddenly I was faced with these five faces looking at me going, girlfriend, you have a movement. This is a business. And I just kind of like sat there. It's like, oh my God, maybe I'm onto something. Like, do other people in the world need to hear this message? And that was the beginning of everything that we're talking about now. It was real crystallization for me that that was my calling. And the reason I went on this journey was to start leading a movement or contributing to the things that people like Ariana Huffington have already started, right? And this is my own flavor of it. And it was really cool, but it was also super daunting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what I really love about that is the fact that you put yourself out there, right, on this uh, writing retreat and that you are asking for feedback. And I think that is almost one of the most crucial ingredients and things for anyone trying to do something is find the right group of people and ask for feedback. That is like one of the most powerful things, you know what I mean? It, not, it helps you on so many different levels and actually being open to accepting, you know, like or being critiqued or whatever, or, you know, accepting feedback is, is really, really powerful. So, um, and that's the reason that you you've gone so far. Do you know what I mean? And I think that's really important for other people to, to uh, remember and to be aware of is like, if you are trying to do something, find the right group of people, ask for feedback, and then you're going to be able to grow from there. Um, yeah. So, I'm yeah. so glad. I'm so glad you paused on that point because I think I was just beginning to figure that out at that time. It's like, Oh, this is what happens when you surround yourself with people, with like-minded souls, with people who, you know, are sort of a similar energetic vibration, right? Like our energy brought us together. 
And we were immediately like instant soul sisters. And so I have now spent more time like really, like I'm very thoughtful about the energy that I put out into the world. And I've done a lot of work to kind of like raise my own vibration. And I'm finding the most incredible people, even being here with you guys, having this kind of conversation because I don't want to have small talk with people. I want to get to the heart of the matter. I want to help inspire people. And so having, you know, this kind of the depth of this kind of dialogue and this kind of storytelling is really important. And I would love for more people to be willing to be vulnerable enough to have this conversation. And I think vulnerability is part of the secret sauce, right? Mm -hmm. It's scary because to sit with people and to share your writing or to share your story or to share your whatever is really freaking scary. Yeah. Sitting yeah. there, it's like, you know, I remember it's like I had pieces of paper, or my laptop or whatever it was. And I'm like telling them stories about like, you know, my, my, my body image issues and my, you know, tension with my mom and like bringing all this stuff out. And I was like, wow, I'm telling this group of perfect strangers about all of this. And it started to help me realize that the more vulnerable we are, the more of a connection it creates. Mm -hmm. 100 percent um i'm actually uh, starting a course today it's a seth godin course around a storytelling workshop um, oh is which that is, his akimbo workshop yes yeah yeah it's yes. a kimbo one so i'm looking really looking forward to doing that because it's another you know another course where you like you basically you get uh, certain prompts and then you have to put your story out there and then the main thing is you actually have to give like five bits of feedback for every one you put out so you have to you know read other people's stories Love give that. them feedback and and his courses are amazing that's how kind of they all all work really so it's, it's about that connection you make and about giving good feedback and um that's where you kind of get to make good changes so um, i so want to hear how that goes as, as you go through the course or maybe at the other end of it because I've, I've looked at that and it just it hasn't been the right time just given all this focus and basically having spent all of last year writing this book to get it out into the world quickly um mm. but yeah I'm, I'm fascinated i love his work i know we were talking about that before we before we started recording but yeah i, I would love to hear what comes out of that and if you have a valuable experience yeah no worries i'll definitely share it with you that's yeah, for sure thank you um so so and get a good plug for sylvatical in there with seth will you yeah no totally <laughs> I'll, I'll link it up and hyperlink it in all my my like writings and stuff don't worry about that <laughs> uh, classic so um <laughs> Uh, Chili, life is a strange way of basically teaching us lessons and showing us actually what is really important. And um, once you had basically taken your soul badical, uh, your dad, probably the healthiest guy ever that, that you knew, uh, had a severe brain hemorrhage. Um, and that completely altered kind of your perspective on what's important in life, didn't it? Oh, it did. It did. And it, it sort of happened, interestingly enough, it happened um about eight months into my sabbatical so my ori original idea was i think this is going to be about a 12 month deal i'll give myself 12 months whether i take 12 months or not um, but i imagined that by the end of 12 months i'd have this you know crystallized idea of what i wanted to be doing in the world and at about month eight after i had gone to france and new zealand and the canadian rockies and the coast of California. I'd done all this amazing travel and I had stopped it down to see my parents in Naples, Florida for, for Easter. And it was the last time I saw my dad healthy. Um, and it was also a trip that I almost didn't make because I was like, Oh, there's always next time, right? There's Thanksgiving or there's Easter or there's whatever. Mm -hmm. And there's not like the, tomorrow isn't even a guarantee not to get dark and morbid, but it's a reality. And so now I just, I appreciate every single minute of every single day. And I also appreciate what my dad and I came to realize as he started to recover. And here we are two and a half years later, he's still recovering. So on one hand, we're incredibly lucky that after two very severe strokes, he's still with us. He's, he's very slowly record, recording, recovering. Um, and he, you know, he's at a point where this is a former CEO and chairman on many, many boards and the leader of some of the most incredible brands. And he can't read, he can't write, he can't tell time. Um, he's in a wheelchair most of the time, but he's learning to walk and doing quite well. 
And it just made me like, I was rediscovering the world with my dad through these new, this new set of eyes. And we were slowing down because he can't do anything fast. And I started to really experience the magic of slowing down and on the trails near their house in Naples, Florida, where we both used to run, you know, and we were running, you know, caught up in our heads, not paying attention to anything. I was seeing everything differently. I was seeing the flowers blossom. I was noticing things. We were assigning language. And then one day we were sitting outside by the pool in their backyard and my dad was trying to express something. You know, he's, he's getting command of language back and now he's getting fairly articulate. He doesn't have his whole vault of vocabulary, but he's, he's getting there. And he was trying to explain to me that after the second stroke, when we actually thought we were gonna lose him, it was the smaller stroke of the two in a quieter part of the brain, but it completely robbed him of his personality and his spirit and his desire to live. And we saw him slipping away. And we actually rescued him and brought him down to Naples and just nursed him back to life ourselves because we thought he's going to die in this rehabilitation center. And what we didn't know at the time that he tried to, that he was expressing to us later is that he knew he was going through this and he was like, I'm okay to die. Like, I don't have the fight in me anymore. And so he started telling me the story and he was so lucid and he hadn't been lucid. He hadn't had all of these words up till that moment. And he basically said, then I woke up like a few days later and I just was like, no, no, I still have work to do in this world, but now it's a different kind of work. And I'm okay leaving the corporate world behind and I'm on this journey for a reason. And I mean, it was not lost on me how similar it was to what I was learning with Solbatical. So here I was having had this eight month journey where these ideas are crystallizing in my own mind. And then my dad's saying he made a decision to live and to like, you know, bring himself back because he saw that there was an opportunity to do something different and still have an impact in the world. And it floored me. I was crying. I had goosebumps. And I just, I remember looking at him and I said, oh my God, dad, like we are in the process, the two of us shifting from, you know, the business, uh, from living business, which is what we had both done for decades and what I had frankly learned from him and followed in his footsteps to the business of living. And we're both realizing that there is a different way of, of living and of creating your life and of impacting the world and the way that you show up in the world. And it was so beautiful to me, that moment of like that shift from living business to the business of living. And that's when I was like, I'm going to write a book. And I actually thought that was going to be like some part of that was going to be the title of the book. And so I brought some of that into the Carmel retreat, which happened a couple months later. So that's how some of it ties together. But that was really powerful. And just seeing my dad's, you know, just his, his will, you know, to, to survive and thrive and get back his faculties was just reminded me that life is short, man. And we take so much for granted. So important. Mm. What a powerful story. Thank you for sharing that with us. And uh, yeah. yeah, I just think it's so important to have these reminders and to take the moment to let them land, you know, and just, you know, take them in. And I think that's, that's, you know, Gareth and I often talk about this, you know, there's always these little things, if you're actually willing to just take note of them that, that are, to remind us daily, like, hey, this is, this is all we've got, you know, like, and, and, and just spend that time with one another and say the right things, you know, and, and also what I got from that little story is like, you know, have hope for people and don't give up on people. Hey, like it's just, yeah. um, you know, you never know what can be around the corner and, and someone can change and look at him now, like probably a few months before that you almost had maybe no hope. And, and then he turned it around because of nurture and loving and, and care and, and the power of that love did something. So yeah, just thanks for that reminder. And, Sort of off the back of that, you know, you know, Gareth and I, we really, rate stress is one of the biggest things that sort of hold uh, people back, uh, which impacts the overall, overall well-being uh, like so much. And you connected with a former, former Navy SEAL, Christopher, 
who um, (laughs) helped you release stress over many months. And um, one of the methods was walking over your body. Um, (laughs) So maybe you can explain more what this sort of therapy entailed. Well, so it's interesting. I still work with Christopher and Mm -hmm. for, I I will, I I never do, Mandy's worked with Christopher as well. I don't know if that came up in the conversation with her. Mm -hmm. Um, She, and and yet all of us still have a really challenging time articulating Christopher's work because I call (laughs) him a wizard. I think he's he's like a magical, he's like not of this earth. Like he's a, Mm -hmm. he's a really, really, um, special human and really uh, vibrant soul and so I was he's part of the coaching community that Mandy and I are both part of there's a group called 4PC that we're part of and Christopher joined that and at this time I didn't even know Mandy worked with him I just remember calling her and I was like I just met the most incredible human and he looked at me and he said Shelly you are the soulbatical message and you need to get anything that's blocking your light out of your way because you need to be a lighthouse for this we were sitting in a car like going on to lunch at whole foods and i was like my whole world was rocked in that moment and i looked at him and i could tell that he was seeing me in a way that nobody else had ever seen me and i mean first of all that's powerful we all know like being seen is very very moving and so often it's like we don't feel like we're seen and we don't really put ourselves in the world to be seen. And I realized that I was finally starting to strip away a little bit of that armor so that I could be seen in the world. And he saw it and he honed in on it. And I said, okay, well, what do you mean? Like what's blocking? And he said, he explained his story. So he now has, his whole story is in a book that came out last September. It's called Free for Life. Um, And it talks about his entire journey and where this comes from. But in essence, I can do it some justice. He works to, he he works on this theory of the fact that we're storing a lifetime of accumulated stress in our bodies and not just our lifetime, but kind of the legacy of generations that are passed down Mm -hmm. to us. And we're storing those in different channels in our body. And so that's blocking our energy. That might be blocking our creativity, but he's helping us release that stress. So there's a combination of things that are kind of spiritual in nature, a little bit coaching in nature. And then there's the actual physical practice. So to get to your specific question, he has um, a way of Walking on your body, particularly the fronts and backs and sides of your legs and doing some work on your arms, that's correlated to different channels. So like gallbladder channels and kidney channels and intestinal channels that all relate to um, different things. And he looks at your human design and all the stuff that's like many pay grades above (laughs) above me that I, I'm still trying to learn and I'm, I'm really intrigued by. And you go on this journey with him. And so he's, he's identifying the channels where your blockages are. He has you doing specific exercises. And when you go in with him, he is working on getting deep into those channels, actually with his feet and toes. So he stands with a walker. So you imagine a walker that older people use, right? He stands with the walker that supports some of his weight, and then he's increasingly putting more pressure on you to start to just work that out. And I'll tell you, it gets, it gets, he's, he's first of all, kind of rebalancing your nervous system, and then he's getting these blockages out of you. And I mean, it stirs things up. You have, I cried, I screamed, I swore at him. I was remembering things from different points in my life that we started working through. Like it's a really unique way of working with people and you commit to a certain lifestyle. So when you work with Christopher, you give up refined sugar, you give up caffeine, you give up um, basically anything processed, um, you give up alcohol, um, any sort of stimulants, right? And so he's really working to bring your nervous system back to a, play, a very natural place that for most of us, it hasn't been that way since the day we were born, hmm. you know, because of all these conditions over time. And it's an incredible process that, like I said, I'm still finding, trying to find the words to put to the experience. And all I can say is I started this work with him in 
August of 2018. And since then, the most incredible, like I can tell my energy, like I feel like a lighthouse now compared to where I was, which is great because I am a lighthouse with my message in the world. And I can't tell you, like my, the frequency I'm putting out in the world is definitely attracting amazing things. Like this book deal fell in my lap. Hmm. Clients are finding me. And I know this isn't luck. Maybe, th maybe there's like a fraction of luck in this, but I think, it's, I think it's a reward for the work that I've done, the alignment I have, and the energy I'm now putting out in the world. And his work was a huge part of that. Mm. So cool. When um, you are aligned, yeah. when you are in connected to that source or to the universe, things will flow, you know? Yep. Yeah. Yeah, what? it's it's so true. And I'm I'm absolutely and he told me that and I was like, what does that look like? You know, I was sort mm. of at the very beginning of this journey. Not at the very beginning. I had done a lot of internal work, but I was ready for like that next phase of work, really going deep. And he's the one who has been my partner and my companion mm. in doing that work. And it's been mm. oh, it's just mind blowing. I'm still doing it. I go see him every two or three months and we spend, he does the work in five day stints and you work with him for minimum three hours a day for five days in a row. And it is, it's excruciatingly painful at times because he's literally, he always says stress is a bitch and you're experiencing it again when he's walking on you and he's finding those blockages, you're realizing how much we've internalized and how much we're keeping inside and the pain that we've created for ourselves. Mm -hmm. Fascinating. Rel reliving it is tough. <laughs> <laughs> I can imagine, but it's... But it's, releasing it is incredible. Yeah, yeah, it certainly is. Wow, it's really fascinating. And I, I think, um, well, both Craig and I are really happy that yourself and Mandy have found Chris and then that he's given yeah. you this kind of alignment and new kind of energy because uh, having people like you spread good vibes and uh, value in the world is really, really important. So... Mm. Um, it feels so, good. Thank you. Yeah, that's cool. So Shelly, I obviously, um, you know, thanks so much for sending us your book. Um, it was a really fantastic read. Um, and it was so nice to, for you to hear you kind of, um, be so authentic and raw and like vulnerable, you know, in your story. And I think that is very powerful in itself. Um, and, and you also share like many practical tools, um, and I think those tools like really help people with, with self-discovery, you know, like it's, that's actually that, uh, where the, the magic happens, do you know what I mean? Yeah. So, um, obviously through our chat, I guess we've, we've discussed maybe the sort of, um, details of it, but not maybe directly. Is there anything else you'd like to say kind of about your book, um, or the movements that you, yeah, I mean, so, so one, one thing that I would say is like, I intentionally created that interactive guide, as I said earlier, because you know what? People will self-select to say, I don't want to do the work. And this book in this whole movement is not going to appeal to people who don't want to do the work. So the people, like if you're in a place where it's like you want to dive in and you want to get to know yourself better and you want to get really, really clear, like getting aligned is where all the potential gets unlocked and all you find all the magic and possibility. And so, you know, that's my intent doing this. And honestly, it's hard work. And, you know, maybe to be a little crass again, I say, fuck life hacks. You know, people talk like there are hacks all over the place. And while I understand the value of hacks in certain spaces, there is no hacking getting to really a true authentic connection with your soul and aligned with yourself. And that's hard work. Mm. And so I just want to say that, you know, so I know this will appeal to the people who are already doing that work, who are ready to do that work, who are ready to do more of that work. You know, it's like, let's do this together. Like, let's, let's, you know, not be looking for shortcuts. Let's just get in there and get messy and be vulnerable together because that's going to create the world that we want to live in. Like, those are the people that I want to be around. And so I'm really genuinely hoping that that's who, you know, those people are who my book finds and they find my book and it can play a role in kind of their awakening, right? Because on the other side, it's just, whoo, it's incredible. I say I'm on a mission to liberate a billion souls. 
And I can't do that on my own, right? All I can do and what I've done through my speaking engagements, through my book, through my coaching work is I can start the ripple that creates the wave that creates the tsunami. And, mm. but it takes all of us, more of us choosing to be chief soul officer of our lives and do the hard work of, of really, you know, upholding the principles of that, that's going to make this um, into something. Mm -hmm. Very cool. And off the back of that, you have a saying about successful. Um, yeah. what, what does that really mean? Yeah. So I say when I was describing my version of success, like when I was back at Harley, you know, I'm like, how can you be so quote unquote successful, right? Success by all the traditional definitions and feel so empty inside. And I was like, well, wait a second. I feel success empty. What does it look like to feel <laughs> successful? And if you think about it, like F U L L I'm like that's fulfilled. What does, cause I was thinking success and fulfillment were mutually exclusive. And when I started to realize through this journey that they don't have to be mutually exclusive at all, and you can have successful, it's rewriting the script of what that looks like. So it is success with fulfillment is really what I'm talking about. So that your insides and your outsides match instead of being completely at odds with each other, like mine were, you know, three and a half plus years ago. So, yeah, so like success a, is fulfillment kind of thing. Yes. Exactly. Yeah. And success, success with fulfillment or success mm. is fulfillment, right? Instead of, you know, these kind of traditional measures of success that revolve around money and big titles and sexy yeah. brands and all the stuff that I'll be really honest, I was super caught up in for a long time. Mm. Sure. Yeah. 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 Um, cool. So, uh, look, before Craig asks you, uh, our, our last question, um, I just like to um, just find out kind of like maybe what you're most excited about uh, going into the future. Uh, like what are you working on? And then also where can kind of people get hold of you? Yeah, I, well, I just, I feel like I'm at the very beginning of this journey. So for this year, at least, like I want to keep spreading the word uh, about Sylbatical. And, you know, my book baby only came out into the universe eight weeks ago. So it's, she's only, I say she's only two months old. <laughs> so I really feel like I'm at the beginning of something and something really meaningful given the responses that I'm already getting from people and just the, the gratitude and the thank you notes that I've been getting and thank you, you know, from people saying, thank you for telling your story and sharing so candidly. And thank you for helping me not feel so alone on this journey or feel ashamed for having these feelings of like, I've made it to the top and is this all there is? So I really feel like I'm at the beginning of whatever this is going to become. And I love being out in front, being the spokesperson for it. And I'm really curious how it's going to morph and shape over time as more and more of us kind of get into it. Um, I'm also excited for book number two. So I already have an idea. This kind of, this kind of lands in a space of, you know, saying if more of us become chief soul officers of our own lives, then culture has to shift and shape around us, especially corporate culture. Mm. And how cool would that be that more of us are doing this and then we start to influence corporate culture and we completely rewrite the script of success and we create cultures that serve the humans instead of the humans serving the culture, which is the way it works today. And we have you know, radical self-care on the C-suite agenda and we have time off in, you know, as a precursor to smart work and creativity and innovation. I mean, it's so backwards here in the States, as you guys know, right? It's like people don't even take their vacation. Hmm. It's silly. So there's a lot of work to be done there. So I, I think I've also teed up a conversation around the soul of business and what that starts to look like. And I think that might be a future book that I write. It's certainly a conversation that I want to get going. Cool. Beautiful. Yeah. Well, you, oh, and where uh, people can find me. Yeah. Um, I'm most active on Instagram. So at Soulbatical is my handle and Soulbatical is S O U L two B's A T I C A L. I always have to say that two B's or not two B's as one of my <laughs> friends jokes. <laughs> um, I'm most active there, but you can also find me on, on Facebook. And if you're interested in diving deeper, I would say read the book, right? You can find the book mm. at any, um, of the, the big, um, 
kind of the big distributors, retailers like Amazon. Um, I know you have a global, I don't know all the, the booksellers around the world. You guys <laughs> probably have a pretty global audience, which is awesome. Um, just Google Solbatical, a corporate rebel's guide to finding your best life and see where it comes up. And help well, me get more distribution yeah. for it around the world. We'll create the <laughs> poll for it. Um, but yeah, and my, my website, soulbatical.com as well, if anybody wants to go deeper on, on who I am and, and what my coaching business entails. Well, we're definitely going to be part of that uh, little wave and then the tsunami. So that is um, really exciting. So thanks for sharing awesome. that. So yeah. just our last question there, Shelley, and it's a question we ask all our guests. And what is being ridiculously human mean to you? I love this question. And I told you guys, I love the word ridiculously. So the, <laughs> I feel like the universe is bringing us together. You know what? I think we've talked about so much of it in this conversation. And to me, it's like, it is just, it's allowing, giving ourselves permission to be messy, right? Like we all think we have to look like we have all the answers. So it's like, no, let's get curious. Like we were talking about before this, it's a superpower to say, I don't know, tell me more, help educate me, you know, and, and yeah, just not feeling like we have to be perfect and knowing that we are good enough. And yeah, that all feels like being ridiculously human. It's sort of like warts and all. <laughs> And that's why I told, I told my story in a ridiculously human way, because if I didn't, people would just look at me as somebody who had achieved it all. And it would be a completely unrelatable story because we compare our insides to other people's outsides. I wanted to show people my insides so they can compare their insides to my insides. That feels ridiculously human to me. Mm -hmm. Wow. That's fascinating. Yeah. Well, you know what? I just, I just remembered something that I'd read recently, and this has made me think of what exactly what you're saying now. It's, it seems a bit out of left field, but octop octopi, right? They communicate on their skin. So basically, people think it's all about um, the uh, camouflage on their skins, right? But actually, that's a, been proven to be a form of communication. So they viscerally are what they think you can just they can't hide it <laughs> you know oh. and it's kind of cool in a way if you think about it like there's you're just bearing everything out on your skin and imagine if we had if we all did that how different we would behave and be in the world and if, if it, it was sort of all just visible on the outside yeah. and uh, i think they've got it they've got it right in a way <laughs> i love it well it's so interesting that you bring up other kind of other species because i just did some work with horses and i know we're closing so i won't make this a long story but just to say for anybody who has never done work with horses it is absolutely life-changing because you realize it's not a choice to be horses simply are and their energy in any given moment, it comes like their power comes from stillness. Their energy is just, they don't know any other way of being. It's not about, because we have this being versus doing tension all the time, right? And most of us get into doing mode and we forget that actually the powerful place is sitting in our being. And horses just taught me that. Actually, Mandy and I were together in Santa Fe recently and it, it blew my mind. And so I've been living by this little mantra that says, be more horse. And so there's a little <laughs> bit, be more horse and be more octopi. <laughs> That's the solution to all of the, you know, ridiculousness going on oh, in our culture it. today. Yeah. <laughs> Well, yeah, when we start opening up our eyes, there's kind of uh, lessons to be had everywhere. That's for sure, especially from nature. So, um, totally. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, Shelly, just wanted to say, like, serious, massive uh, thanks for coming on our podcast and, and sharing your story. Not only on our podcast have you shared it so vulnerably, but, like, in your book, too. And, and like, what you said, you know, what being ridiculously human means to you. And uh, I think that is so important, you know, like, when we are vulnerable and we tell our story how it is it gives other people permission to do the same you know and i think that is massively powerful like we must all just get vulnerable you know because if we can all empower people that way you know uh, then it's going to be a fantastic place to live in um and just a bit about you know what i loved about the book as well is that 
not only is this great story and I'm so glad you started writing again, um, but also it's the practical tools that you provide as well at the end of each chapter that I think is such a great combination and such an awesome way to write a book. So I hope the next ones are kind of like, you know, maybe along the same sort of thing. Cause I think, you know, you often you read a book and you know, you're like, cool, that was good. That was really, really good. And then you forget it, you know, but if you, if you actually have uh, these tools and like questions to answer and stuff, like you, you actually, one, you remember the book a hell of a lot more, you know, and then two, you actually get so much more value out of it. So, um, you know, thank you for writing it that way. And then, um, yeah, just really happy that we've made this connection and then you, you're a great speaker. Um, I can only imagine, you know, people take a lot from the talks that you get. Um, so you. just thank you for sharing everything. It's been an absolute honor to have you on our show today. It has been an honor and thank you for reflecting all of that back. It really, my soul is singing. Yeah, thank you. Right. And just briefly from my side, Shelley, you know, talking about your soul, from my side, you can totally tell your your head, your heart, and your soul is is so connected. And it's interesting as we sit here now, you've got a little sort of a light in the background oh, yeah. behind you. Yeah, there. My and halo. I, yeah, exactly. Your <laughs> halo is there. I've been thinking that the whole time. And, That's hilarious. Uh, <laughs> I just am noticing that now. I should reposition myself so I'm like that. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. But actually, I was thinking awesome. your lighthouse, you know, you, you totally, when you said that, I was like, well, there you go. It's like you're totally shining and, and just in, influencing people in such a great way. So keep it up. We can't wait to see book two, um, even though let your, let your baby first to grow a little bit yes. before <laughs> big two come. But epic work. And just thanks for the time. We're just so grateful to Mandy again. Uh, for this introduction. We're glad we've crossed paths and all the best for the future. Yeah, thank you. And let's stay connected. For sure. Waking at dawn, packing the gear, September tour and up in the air. Stop at the toll, digging.